happy to welcome you all here today. And I always ask this same question, and I get smiles from people who've heard it before, and the question is simply, for how many of you, raise your hand, is this your first Nelson Center entrepreneurship event? Wow, that's a lot of new people. So happy to have especially all of you here. And uh, I say that because we define entrepreneurship in a very expansive way, which is a structured process for problem solving. And that is one of the reasons that we're attracting people from all across campus, every discipline, department, uh, concentration. And then how many of you are not even affiliated with Brown? You're here from the community and everything beyond Brown. Anybody? Great. Well, uh, if, if uh, you have friends who are in the community, you're welcome to uh, invite them because these kinds of events are open to anybody who is interested. If you're not already on our email list, I encourage you to learn more about us and sign up by going to entrepreneurship.brown.edu. Uh, that's the only thing I normally say in those intros that require anything of you uh, to respond, but we want to do that so that you're in the loop and feel invited and welcome to come to all of these kinds of things. Uh, these are part of the second bucket of our programming. The first is curricular, which means in the classroom learning. The second is like these, out of the classroom learning. And the third is we provide venture support. So if these kinds of events motivate you, inspire you to take action and do something about your interest in entrepreneurship, then come see us because we have all sorts of resources that you can learn about on our website that might uh, be useful to you. Uh, really happy to have Dr. Day here. We both realized that we were here at the same time on campus when we were students and uh, when this was a store 24 yeah. at an entrepreneurship center. Uh, others I see nodding in the back. And very happy to have Robbie, one of our star students here to help uh, moderate this uh, event. Thank you both and thank you to all of you for being here today. I'll turn it over to Robbie. Right. <clears throat> so I'm Robbie Felton. I'm junior here studying public health. Uh, at the Nelson Center, I've participated in Brown Venture Prize as well as uh, the Breakthrough Lab with my venture that I founded with fellow uh, Brown students Evan Jackson and Samuel Prado. We work on home health care, uh, tech, making at-home patient care federally compliant and more efficient through electronic visit verification. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Piali Day here, the founder of Sensio Systems, um, and she can tell you a little bit more about what she's been working on. Okay, well, thank you for having me here. It's, um, I don't know, it's been decades since I've been back to the Brown campus, so it's, uh, it's nice to be back, and I could barely recognize Third Street. So much has uh, changed. Um, so uh, when I was here, I was working on my PhD in physics, and it was theoretical physics, and I uh, got interested in artificial intelligence. I remember uh, Professor Leon Cooper, who, uh, I don't know if he's still here or not, uh, but he, I had a, I got a Nobel Prize in semiconductor physics, so theoretical physics, the same field that I was working in, and then went on to do some really cool stuff with neural networks. And so as I was getting my degree, I'm like, wow, that, that's very, very cool. So I wondered if I could uh, also uh, find myself in a place where I am uh, taking my learning in physics and doing something in the field of artificial intelligence. And so I did my usual postdoc stuff and little stint in academia, but I eventually found myself uh, in uh, industry. I went to the defense industry because I figured there's a lot of data in the defense industry and AI has got to create value there. And I worked in the defense industry for well over 20 years, always application of uh, algorithms, uh, machine learning to uh, take complex uh, data and turn it into some sort of a meaning that was actionable. And then about uh, 10 years ago, nine and a half years ago, I had a wonderful career in the defense industry. I really had no uh, thought about leaving. Um, but um, my um, husband, who also got his PhD here at Brown University, physics department, we met here, we got married here. Um, and he had directed his career to uh, start multiple medical device companies. And uh, so he's doing medical device. I'm doing artificial intelligence in defense industry. And we're sitting and having dinner with our parents. So at that point, uh, this was a dinner at uh, Hugh's parents' house. My father had already passed away, but my mother was there at the dinner. So he, here's Hugh and I sitting across from our three remaining parents, and it just occurred to us on this one night, same night, 
that our parents were struggling to plan out their days, figure out what does that week look like, what comes next, what do I do? A lot of hesitation, brilliant people, absolutely brilliant people. My father-in-law was a physicist, and yet they were not able to connect the dots in their own lives. And connecting the dots is what I did. I mean, I, th that was my job. So we're driving home that night after dinner, and both you and I almost sort of simultaneously said, what are we doing? Could we do something for our parents? So just in that 10 minute car ride, we decided that uh, we'll start a company where we're gonna apply artificial intelligence to healthcare, medical devices, and just, fit, and just to do something for our parents. We knew nothing more than that. So that led me to leaving my job, and then within two weeks we started this company, and we built some very foundational artificial intelligence technology. <laughs> Because we didn't want to just go solve uh, a particular problem. We wanted to create something that, was, that could evolve into solving progressively bigger and bigger problems. And, uh, that, and that's been our journey. So it's almost, uh, that was uh, November 1 of 2010 is when we started. Wow. It's been nine years. We're in November. I didn't even realize. So we've been at this for nine years. And um, where, we, uh, where we are is exactly where we want it to be. Um, obviously, would have liked to get here faster, but that's, I think, every entrepreneur's story probably. It's never fast enough. Uh, but it is about uh, helping aging uh, the aging population who have uh, multiple chronic conditions. And there's just a lot they have to understand about their health. There's a lot that they have to think about their health. But we all know that as we age, our own cognitive ability naturally degrades. So our mission is, as our own cognitive ability does one of these, could we just supplement it with artificial intelligence so that we're continuing to operate at a high enough cognitive level to live the quality of life we all want to live until, of course, death do us part. There's nothing you can do about that. So a fast fall off the cliff in the end, but good quality of life all along the way because artificial intelligence is going to keep you smart enough to do that in the home about your health. So we started Sensio Systems. Um, I'll tell you a little bit of story around the name Sensio. Um, you all know the Latin word sensi, right? Meaning to sense. And then there's a Latin word seal. I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, but it's in the middle of the word consciousness. And it actually means to understand and to know. And we said, okay, let's slap the two together because what we want to do is we want to collect a lot of data, which is sensing. But then we really want to understand what is the data telling us. And we want to know what should we do next. Because that's what we wanted for our parents. The ability to know what is it that I should do today, tomorrow, next week. And so that combination of sensing, understanding, and knowing is what to us the word sensio means. And that was the start of the company. Yeah, that's a very interesting backstory. What do you think AI's role is specifically in healthcare? So um, AI is uh, very, very uh, useful when you have uh, a lot of data, a variety of data, and the decision timelines are short. Okay? And defense, obviously, is a place where that is absolutely the case. But so it is the case in healthcare. Um, there are, if you have multiple chronic conditions, there's so many different uh, symptoms that you should be thinking about, so many different things, activities that you should be tracking for yourself. So there's a, there's a huge variety of data, not so much velocity, but there's definitely enough velocity of data. So there's variety of data, there's velocity of data, and timeliness of decision making is critical. So those are the three areas where uh, AI actually works very, very well. So AI in healthcare is just going to see uh, a lot of uh, use. So for example, uh, all the image recognition stuff and radiology and stuff. This is what I was do doing in defense. My first AI job was uh, from an aerial sensor. Could you tell which tanks are ours and which tanks are enemy tanks? So uh, image recognition. Uh, sound recognition, those are all uh, typical AI problems that, again, in the, in, in the um, healthcare side, uh, we have been worked on a, a device where you can listen to the lung, uh, sound of the lungs to figure out if, the, if there's fluid that's building up. And that's, of course, very important to know for pre-pneumonia uh, detection. 
So, uh, so uh, recognizing patterns in sound, recognizing patterns in images, those are standard stuff. Mm -hmm. um, then there will be a lot of stuff around loneliness. Loneliness is a huge exacerbator of health. Mm -hmm. And as we all live longer, uh, chances are we're going to spend a lot of our lives living alone. So could there be con conversational AI? I think there will be. And I think there will be some benefit to that. Uh, the stuff we have now is uh, not, not there yet. Not there right. yet, yeah. but I think uh, there will be. Uh, but uh, another the piece of AI that we are very excited about is planning. Planning is a hard in intellectual problem. I mean, right. think about when you are planning, how many things you have to factor in and, uh, under, and have a sense as to what is it that you're going to optimize around. Planning is hard. But I think uh, that's the type of AI we're trying to do around healthcare is planning. Uh, and you see the planning in the home, one sec, you see the planning in the home, but you will see the planning across uh, caregivers, sons and daughters, uh, uh, home, home care workers. Mm -hmm. You come into a situation, you don't know exactly what has happened. If something could just give you situational understanding, because right. all planning begins with situational understanding, but AI can create that. That's the work I was doing in the defense industry for the intelligence agency. So you create situational understanding. And AI is really good at creating situational understanding. In the home, if you want to have situational understanding, well, what do you do? Well, if somebody was there for the first eight hours of the day, and there's a shift change, the next shift comes in, you ask the person who's leaving, well, talk, tell me where we are, what got done, what right. didn't get done, what do I need to do? But it's that fleeting, uh, while you're passing in the hallway conversation to get situationally oriented so that then you can go plan and execute for your shift. Wouldn't that be great if that was just all done by AI so it's not a passing conversation in the hallway? You can settle down, put your purse down, take your jacket off, ask the AI, where am I? What has happened so far today? Right. What happened yesterday? So I think situational understanding is hugely important for AI. And then if the AI can take that uh, some steps further and say, and now here's some of the things you may want to think about doing. Leave the decision to the individuals, because um, we're not robots. But there's a long ways we can help with the timeliness of decision making that I think the AI is going to be very critical to. Some questions. Yeah, we can we can take questions right there. Yeah, when you uh, talk of situational understanding, this is under the realm of AI. Is that diving from machine learning to deep learning? Uh, so okay, uh, that's that's a good question. Um, I think um, AI these days is so associated with machine learning, and I think that's only half of AI. Um, AI is both reasoning which way back when used to be expert systems, but you can do many more types of reasoning than the if-then-else type logic. But AI, to me, think about your brain. It's not just pattern recognition. There were lots of things you were taught. You are here in this institution because of all the things you're, you're being taught. And they become part of your reasoning framework. So when our brains work, it is simultaneously reasoning, but it's also observing. So it's reasoning that's telling you what to observe. <coughs> Your observation detects patterns, and those patterns now are triggering other parts of reasoning. So it's that perfect combination of reasoning, triggering learning, and learning triggering reasoning, to me, is the totality of AI. And I feel frustrated when AI just automatically gets interpreted into machine learning. However, if it, for that half of AI, sure, there are many machine learning techniques and there can be deep learning techniques, but for what we do, it's not about deep learning. Because it's more, planning is so much more of a reasoning function. When you're planning, you're not saying, oh, let me see, did I ever see a pattern that was exactly the circumstance? Let me recall that pattern and that's what I'm going to do. That's not the case. But it's a combination that I encourage you all to think about. Don't just think AI is machine learning and then machine learning is deep learning. That just happens to be today's hot button. Uh, back when I was a student here, it was neural networks. And deep learning is a, could be a form of neural networks. And oh yeah, boy, did I love neural networks and immerse myself in it. But as I got older and older, I realized it's not about the technique. It's about stepping back and creating just that combination of thoughtfulness, and, I, and, and that's exactly what AI is. 
It is thoughtfulness. It's thinking. Right. So it seems like a, a big issue or a thing you've been touching on is a lack of interoperability as well as intercommunication within the healthcare system. So what do you think is the kind of principal issue within healthcare at the moment? Oh boy. Wow. That's a great question. So you all know healthcare, our healthcare system is broken. Everybody talks about it. It's a broken healthcare system. And the reason it's broken is it's become hyper specialized. And it is fragmented. Right. Uh, I remember my favorite pulmonologist, and I love him. He's just a great guy. He's helped us develop our uh, COPD algorithms. I remember talking to him once, and he said, you know, Piali, I only care about this part of the body, and in that, the heart is taking up too much space. <laughs> Never mind, without the heart, there is no lung to function, and there is no uh, job for a pulmonologist, but that's not the point. The point is everybody is just very hyper-specialized, uh, mm -hmm. and every decision-making is happening in compartments. And right. there is very little um, incentive or system in place to cut across. And it's that cutting across is where we're failing our aging <coughs> population. For them, it's not just about the lungs. It's about everything. It's about the fact that the refrigerator is bare. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that the cat has shed so much in the living room that they can't breathe. So it is everything. So defragmenting the healthcare system is where I think work has to be done. Right. Um, we have the best devices in the world. We have the best trained doctors in the world. We have the best hospitals in the world. Yet we have one of the worst healthcare delivery systems uh, among the um, affluent nations. And I think it's a failure in integration, which to me is a failure in systems thinking. We're not thinking about this as a system. Even thinking about the human body as a system, okay, how the heart system works with the lung system, with the kidney system, with the brain system, with the muscles. You are taught all of this in medical school. Look at the body as a system. But even if we could fathom that, we are not thinking about this body in context with the next body and the next body, the population level thinking, and then just creating a healthcare system that is not making decisions in isolation. We've gotten to where we are because we make decisions in isolation. And I guarantee you, whether it happens in my lifetime or not, that by the time this problem is fixed, AI is going to be a key part of, uh, uh, of just pulling that thread across and connecting the dots. And that's what I worked a lot after 9-11. 9-11 obviously was a wake-up call to us as a nation. And some of you were around then, right? I think most of us. Okay, so there's the, the, uh, uh, 2001. So yeah, yeah I guess I you know. all were, right? Apologize for that. So 9-11 was a wake-up call for the defense industry because there was a lot of data that was available and telling. And if somebody were to sit and parse through all the data, they would have said, okay, uh, I see a pattern here. This pattern doesn't only make sense if this is what's going to happen. But of course, nobody connected the dots. And nobody connected the dots because this intelligence agency knew this, another intelligence agency knew this, and the laws of secrecy told us that, that, that those don't co-mingle. All that changed after 9-11. Uh, 13 intelligence agencies were all brought under one unified umbrella, uh, the Office of uh, National Intelligence. And we really started to break through those walls. And that's kind of what we have to do. And I feel sad every day. Because on 9-11, we know thousands of uh, individuals died. But in our healthcare system, we have a 9-11 day every single day. Every single day, a lot of um, socio uh, 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 folks who are not in the most privileged uh, rung of society are dying because our healthcare system is failing them. But we don't talk about them because we don't have the spotlight. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. Every single day is a 9-11 day as far as I'm concerned in, in the healthcare industry. And that's what gets me up and going every single day um, because the, fixing this problem is urgent. So how do you think AI can uh, kind of fix disparities, social disparities within healthcare? Um, yeah. Um, so. We're fundamentally very good people, and we're compassionate people. Uh, so uh, when our AI highlights that here's a need that is unmet, and that if this need remains unmet, here's the bad thing that's going to happen, 
then there are resources available. No one's going to say, oh, no, 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 let them just talk to death. That's not who we are. It just is, it happens that way because no one knows. Uh, so uh, every day we solve this problem. Uh, surface, surface the issue, uh, such and such missed his last three doctor's appointment, and every day is getting worse and worse because he had no transportation. The ride didn't come. The neighbor didn't show up. These are all things we can know, and these are all things that can go into the planning and the predicting that there's going to be a problem. So it's not a resource issue. The resource is there. It is just connecting the resource to the knowledge. The knowledge is not there. And the only way we're going to create that knowledge, I think, for every single individual, and then the group that that individual is actually a part of, because there's lessons to be learned from that, that's the population level learning we're doing, is the AI's job. Right. I just don't think there's a more important job for AI than to co connect all those dots and surface the problem. Because we've got the resources to solve the problem. That's not the problem. I think we had a hand back here. You said that healthcare is a system. Can you talk more about the role of AI in preventative care as well? Uh, say that last sentence again. Uh, uh, can you talk more about the role of artificial intelligence in preventative care as well? Preventive care? Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what we do. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, preventive care just means you know ahead, you know earlier than otherwise that there is a problem. Right now, our healthcare system is purely reactive. The doctor does not think about it until you call. And you don't call until you are acutely aware that there is a problem because you don't want to bother the doctor. So by definition, the way the healthcare system is set up, it's set up to be a reactive system. And we're always just <coughs> jumping into action. It's like firefighters. Oh, building burning, I jump into action. However, what our AI is doing is three to seven days before even, say, I will recognize that and something's going wrong, the AI is surfacing it. And, and the AI is very good at doing that because I may be in denial. I can't afford to be sick. I gotta get to Providence today. I gotta do this, I gotta do that. So I live in denial. But the AI doesn't care. It doesn't live in denial. So it can surface. So I'll give you simple examples. Uh, we do very well with COPD. And I remember I once read a paper um, uh, published in Germany that there's a clear correlation that if your COPD exacerbation gets to the point where you need it to be hospitalized, you have a permanent lung damage. So, okay, first exacerbation, your lung is here. Second exacerbation, your lung is here. And I think there were about seven or so before you just are, you know, you're dragging a tank behind you and you're counting your days. So the point was, could we just let those things not become full exacerbations that needed hospitalization? So we said to ourselves, okay, what, what are those uh, signals we can pick up that will allow this to be treated in the home? And it took us about two years to pick up what those signals were. The traditional stuff, wait to see if your oxygen saturation drops or not, are way late indicators. There are a lot of early indicators. Like a combination of a breathing difficulty as well as a cough that's getting worse, plus you track the movement and I'm starting to shuffle my feet. Okay, so those are early indicators. You, and, and there is a collection of evidence, and that's where the, some of the machine learning comes in, and oh, we've seen this pattern before. And this will, if I don't do something right now, become a full-blown uh, exacerbation in, in three days. Well, what works? Well, there too, AI and the pattern learning could tell you, well, this early on, uh, use your inhaler, uh, cough productively. Uh, if that doesn't take care of things, then use your antibiotic. But all those pathways as to what works <laughs> three to seven days before, otherwise the doctor would have seen you in the doctor's office or the hospitalist would have seen you in the hospital, those pathways are also things that we can now discover. So I think the, uh, the work with the AI that we do, our mission is to take everything we know today and see if you can know it three to seven days sooner. And that gives you the opportunity to be preventive. And I have this theory that for older people, there's just only so many hospitalization events that they, their body and their psyche can take. Okay, so let's just eliminate as many of them as you can. We can take this in here. Yeah, how do you guys deal with like potential false negatives or false positives, and, like some reliability, possibly in that? Yeah, uh, so this is one of the reasons I don't do deep 
learning is because we have to explain everything we do. Uh, FBA itself is actually uh, still on the fence and, and more, most likely to regulate algorithms that are black boxes. So because the way we do our AI, we're just creating that trail of evidence and we're surfacing that trail of evidence to the doctor and say, here's what we observed. And here's why, why we think based on history and based on science, why we think it's headed that way. And with that explanation, there's always something there. We're not saying, oh yeah, this is a COPD exacerbation. We're putting up the trail of evidence, and there's something that the doctor will then say, you know what, yeah, let me just be careful here. And because we're picking things up three to seven days uh, uh, earlier, it's, it's minor stuff. It doesn't hurt you if you just if you're in, use your inhaler uh, extra time. So the, the remedy is not drastic, and there is something there. And we've got to keep poking at it. And, and we've, uh, actually, there have been cases where we found out uh, it wasn't a COPD exacerbation. It actually was the beginning of a heart failure problem. So you got treated as a COPD exacerbation, uh, did something, uh, not, didn't really go away. And then as you poked and poked at it, it the realization was this has now become a heart issue. So that's all we're trying to do. Bring out the evidence. And, and, and let doctors do their doctoring. And they'll do it. They, it's not like they're married to the fact that until the phone rings and the nurse creates an appointment for you, I'm not going to think about you. That's not what they want to do. They'll think about you anytime you give them a reason to think about you. You're working with complex patients with many different comorbidities. Um, and a lot of them might be dual enrolled in, let's say, Medicare, Medicaid, or have some sort of private insurance. What has been the difficult? most difficult thing with navigating the, the complex reimbursement system that we have in the United States? Oh, you know, one could not have devised a worse healthcare system than we have. Um, it is impossible. It is impossible. And I have been doing a little bit of studying on the history of how our healthcare system got to be. And, and part of it is because we're trying to fit healthcare into a bit of a capitalist model. And, and so that, that's introduced some problems. But we've got the system we've got. We've got, uh, if you are an older adult, you've got Medicare to take care, pay for your medical care. And if you're also poor, you've got Medicaid to pay for your non-medical care. But your non-medical care and your medical care are all one thing. If I didn't have the right to go pick up my meds and I didn't take my meds, that becomes a medical problem two days from now. So you have created a system where there is complete walls between these two aspects of life within a house. How many of you think that what I eat and how I sleep and whether I talk to anyone had any relationship to my health or not? Of course it does. But we created a healthcare system that pretends that there, there isn't. Those are two different programs, two different funding mechanisms. You can't acknowledge from one to uh, impact the other and vice versa. However, things are changing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid is actually run by the same government entity as they have decided, finally, that to compartmentalize all of this does not work. Right. So there is a, uh, there is a, there is a, there are a, there's a class of individuals in this country, there's only 10.5 million of them, therefore dually eligible, meaning they are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid benefits. They are per capita the costliest, uh, uh, healthcare recipients in our system. And that's just because the right hand isn't helping the left hand, and the left hand isn't helping the right hand. I mean, try going through life just using one hand. Well, it's doable. I take that back. Um, and so, um, and so um, and, and, but for those individuals, again, the AI is the one that cuts across all of this. Because the folks who are providing the long-term services and support are not trained to nor is paid to worry about what's happening on the medical side and vice versa. But the AI, because it's looking at the whole person, the whole life perspective, it's paid to do both. Um, and there are programs now that are saying, what do we get when we integrate the two? Now, how we integrate the two from a system perspective, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we work with a lot of duals, and we say, well, one component of the system is integrated knowledge. Let's begin with that. And that integration of knowledge is what we are uh, creating. Once you have integrated knowledge, then you can build the rest of the pieces around it. What about integrated payment? 
What about integrated workflow? You can start to address those problems if, if at least there was a bedrock of the common situational knowledge about this person. Right, yeah, no, that's a very interesting point. I think we had a hand right here. Here is as good as your input data. So uh, when you send something, you know, if you were taking an object, you were able to use your model. I hope it's in your data. Yeah. So the machine learning piece of it, obviously, is just all depends on the data. Uh, the reasoning piece, less so. Yes. Um, uh, so what we do is, uh, when we uh, uh, first start with an individual, we know nothing about them. We have no data about them. So we are all logic-based, all reasoning-based, textbook. OK? Mm -hmm. I know nothing about you, hence I'm just going to apply the laws of physics to you. And then over time, of course, every day our, our members interact with the system, we are picking up data. Um, and it is, sometimes it's just data taken automatically through Bluetooth or it's pers person entered, but it, common sense logic can apply a lot of purification to that data. So we learn your trends and then we um, ask you if, if the data looks like it's dirty or incorrect, that is this correct? So, so you bake into your data collection mechanism itself enough common sense logic to have it be relatively pure. And then when you learn from that, you get uh, uh, a, a pure um, uh, results. Uh, this is one of the reasons I'm a little bit worried about the sort of the big data, because you're working with data that's out there already. What's its provenance is, is unknown, maybe, or known and not clearly known. We collect all our data, and we clean it, and we then learn from it. And we're collecting thousands of data points from the home. And we're mostly, oh, primarily working with home data, because that's the densest data. It, it, with all the data we're collecting from the home, it hardly matters what was your blood pressure when you went to see your doctor. It's immaterial, because we got all that from the home. So we collect pristine data, and then we reason around that. So are you interpreting like, potential patients? Yeah. Real time, real time, real time. We had a question in the back. Um, so I'm wondering, I need to ask, sorry, healthcare defense mechanisms. Um, what are some, some difficulties you faced when transitioning from using AI in defense versus using AI for healthcare, and how did you navigate those two particular? Make sure I fully answer that. So, so what were yes. some oh. of the difficulties in um, moving from AI in defense to AI in healthcare? Yeah. Um, I thought about a lot when I decided to leave my uh, defense career, and it occurred to me that there's very little difference, and here's, uh, and here's why. In both cases, it's a life or death decision. Okay? That's a huge common thing. And in both cases, there is a notion around command and control. In the military, the command and control is all the way from your you know, major to your captain to the president of the United States, and there's the same notion of command and control. Okay, you've got some command and control within the home, and then it's the doctor, there's a spinalist, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of structural similarities between the two, and I thought about this out, because I wasn't going to give up my really good defense career only to fail in healthcare. <laughs> but, the, but the parallels are, are quite similar. Now, the difference, of course, is in the difference uh, in the type of data, but that doesn't matter. Image is an image, whether it's an image underwater of a, of a, uh, a bomb or uh, it's, a, it's, the in, it's your tumor in your breast, it really just doesn't matter. Uh, so the modalities didn't matter, uh, the velocity of the data, they are all the same. So there is actually far more similarity, but primarily because of it, they're both a matter of life and death, you have to understand why you're making the decision you're making, and there's a command and control structure in both environments. So it translates very easily, actually. Right here. Um, in collecting the data to try to build this systemic understanding, how do you address concerns of privacy, both on the technical side and also in convincing the patient that their data is secure? Yeah, that's, that's a very... Uh, important consideration as you design the system. So privacy on the technical side is actually uh, uh, pretty easy. Um, um, we 
just keep all our data, all our personally identifiable data completely separate from our health data. So and there's a key up there that uh, with very careful precision is made into the data mm -hmm. before we present the data in an identifiable way. So the technical piece is not hard. But I will tell you, just do not mix personally identifiable information with non-identifiable information. Day one, do not cross that line. Keep them in two separate bowls. Put them in different cities if you need to. Put them in different countries if you can. Okay, and that's what we do. Yeah. And because I had this background working with the intelligence agencies, it was pretty logical to me as to how you technically keep the data separate. Now, how you handle the privacy piece, that's psychology. And it is so important to be respectful around people's needs for privacy. So one of the things we did is uh, we did not take a camera into our, our uh, system. And the uh, first question I get when I show the system to someone, how come there isn't a camera? Because what do the doctors want to do? They want to look at you. And I said, but that person who's just walking around the house doesn't want you to look at her if she's not dressed, doesn't have makeup on, just got out of bed. So whose interest are you serving here? Well, it's the person in, in the home. So just be very careful as to uh, what data you collect and what you do with it. We never share the data. We share the reasoning. And we provide the trail of evidence. And that too, we are very sure. We do not let anybody sign on to the program until they understand the program. They see the data they are collect we are collecting. They understand who we share it with and why and when. Because that trust, the day that trust is broken, the day they're spooked about it, you're done. There will be a pile of rubble tossed out the window. And we don't want to get there. And then we also do understand that this is, uh, we, we, have, they, we help them manage their own health, and that is critically important. They want to be empowered, and that's what we do. So the psychology of the user is everything around privacy and their willingness to give you that data. So work the psychology. Work the psychology long before you design the system. Psychology trumps UI any day. I guess I have one more hand back there. When you are deciding who gets to take part in your program, do you have any exclusion and exclusion criteria? Um, for people who join the program? Yeah. Uh, we do actually have one uh, for the time being, largely because we're still a small company and we can't be all things to all people. So we uh, do require you have some, uh, some really devastating um, chronic conditions like COPD, CHF. Uh, along with a few minor ones. We do, we are, we're pretty much focused on that dually eligible population, the folks who are economically constrained, because you know, planning is a luxury of the privileged. If you have no resources, what can you plan for yourself? You can't even plan to go call Uber to get yourself to a doctor's mm -hmm. office. So it's a very different uh, challenge to plan for people who have no resources, so we have a, uh, focused on building up our planning skills for uh, those socioeconomically um, disenfranchised. The place we're, we're going next is dementia. Um, in fact, one of the first abilities that go when you have dementia is the planning thing. And then the next thing is uh, if, if language becomes an issue or whatever, prompting people, asking for help is another thing that dementia folks, even if they knew they needed it, it is not something that they comfortably do. Uh, and then cracking, of course, that's a memory issue uh, that that goes to. So we very carefully pick the population, actually, because we want to have the greatest impact. And then we match it. Is this something that AI actually can make a difference to? So it's a, it, designing the system is we touched about psychology. We, we touched about the need. We touched upon whether it, the, the solution itself can actually make a difference. So a lot goes into it. Uh, but down the road, I, I say in 100 years from now, the moment we're born, maybe there's a chip embedded in, in us, which is just going to have all our bio data, and, uh, and all of this reasoning about us is going to happen, and we don't have to worry about, you know, why is that cough today? Is it poor air quality, or am I coming down with something? It, we, it can all be done. Uh, it's the societal change, it's the cultural change that is far bigger uh, impediment now than the technical. So how many patients do you currently serve? 
So at this very moment, we probably have, we're only operating in Maine and New Hampshire right now, probably got about 250 or so. Um, it's a small group. Uh, over the last few years, we've, helped, uh, we've supported about 700 people. So we've got a lot of learning under our belt. We've uh, supported folks for over 300,000 days and enough data to see a lot of patterns. And again, we take uh, similar groups. We right. don't take one of this and one of that because then you can't generate any mm -hmm. learning at the population level. So we're very methodical in how we're uh, building up our cohort to maximize the learning. Right. Oh, back there. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious about, as a scientist, what has been some of the challenges for you to navigate the business and like entrepreneurship part of this? <coughs> That's been the key this year. And, and uh, most difficult part of my job as a CEO uh, is to come to terms as to how slow change is. Um, and, and the reason change is slow is because of uh, business interest. And uh, that's, that's been tough, um, very tough. Uh, so uh, as a scientist, I can really imagine and understand the system and figure out how to uh, work with the system. But I had no idea how much force it was going to take to move the system to even slightly budge. And that's a matter of experience. Uh, and I don't know what, other than trial and error, and uh, I don't know what answer there is to it. So I still think systems thinkers, if you are, are going to be an entrepreneur, train yourself to be a systems thinker. Because your business is a system, the problem you're solving has got to be part of a system. So make sure you understand the system. If I were to do this all over again, I'd spend the first four years working on the business model. And the next four years working on the AI. I would completely flip it. Uh, however, eight, nine years ago, there wasn't even an inkling of the business model because the healthcare system was not hurting as badly as it's hurting now and people could choose to ignore it. So there's just a lot that goes into it. I would just say that don't, don't go with your strength. Everybody wants to, so did I. It's what we love. Maybe go with your uh, weaknesses first. Last question before we wrap up. Such a good question. Such a good question. Uh, that's um, um, that's a great last question. Uh, so yeah, you if uh, if you if your goal is to fill in the gaps in knowledge, you cannot tolerate gaps in knowledge. So that's why we started in the home, where there was the biggest nothing was known about it. And before we come out of the home, we're going to make sure that we have as complete an understanding from the home as it's necessary to then come out of the home. So our journey towards building the knowledge is very systematic. And I'll give you an example. Most people who are doing AI in healthcare actually are starting with the claims data. Because it's available. And you can throw it into all sorts of deep learning algorithms. And it does, of course, you create a bubble of knowledge around it. But what good is that piece of knowledge if there are all these other knowledge gaps before you can actually make a difference? So we said, okay, where is the greatest knowledge gap? It's in the home. Build that out. Walk out. What's the next thing? Well, it's the knowledge gap between the doctor and you. So smooth that out. And you just, if, if the goal is to eliminate gaps in knowledge, do it methodically. But a lot of AI is not about just filling in that whole continuum of knowledge. It's about, oh, let me just let me create this additional knowledge and there's someone uh, for whom it's going to be valuable and they will pay. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing whatsoever. Knowledge is always valuable. Knowledge is always power. Knowledge always makes money. No problem. But for the mission that we are creating, the problem is the total lack of knowledge. So our commitment, again, we'll be doing this probably well past my lifetime, but our goal is to systematically eliminate that knowledge gap. And that's part of system thinking. Thank you so much, Dr. Day, for speaking with us. <laughs> um,
also thank you to the Nelson Center for bringing in Dr. Day, and feel free to stick around if you have any questions for her. Great questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.